Hi everybody, I'm Seb Lose. I'm the uh, simulation industry manager here at Epic Games. I'm also uh, the co-chairman for the aerospace uh, chapter of the uh, VRAR association. Uh, today, uh, I'm joined by Rick Parker, who is my co-host for this session. And uh, we have Scott Schneider and Chris Vere with us from HTX Labs. Chris is the co-founder and CTO of HTX Labs and has served in senior technology and operational roles for over 20 years in the software industry. Chris has been involved in various startups companies and has taken on a primary role of overseeing the development and delivery of enterprise software across numerous industries. Scott is the co-founder and CEO of HTX Labs and has over 35 years uh, serving in software and technology leadership positions across numerous industries and companies such as Boeing, uh, and various startup companies. Uh, Scott provides the vision and strategic direction for HTX Labs relative to driving opportunities in the aerospace and defense, oil and gas, and aviation industry. Today, their presentation is a case study enabling Air Force uh, pilots and maintenance crew to leverage immersive technology to train anytime, anywhere, on any device. Thank you, Seb, and uh, you basically covered my entire present part of the presentation. But no, I will. Uh, so thanks, thanks, Seb, and uh, of Epic Games and Rick Parker of ETR for uh, inviting us to participate today. Um, let's see. So, uh, quick agenda. Um, I know we've got about an hour. I'm going to try to pour through the first part of the slide deck here pretty quick. We are an XR company, so. We want to do. We want to show XR technology and not PowerPoint. Um, but I want to do a quick intro on kind of uh, on who HTX Labs is. For those who don't know, talk a little bit about our XR journey, um, and then quickly move into um, some of the some of the challenges that we've seen within our work with the U.S. Air Force, Department of Defense. But it's not unique and specific to them. This is an enterprise uh, wide kind of uh, XR training challenges. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to dive in a little bit deeper on the uh, on our impact immersive training platform that Rick so nicely uh, plugged during Seb's uh, presentation earlier. Um, and uh, and then we'll talk through some duty use cases kind of to back up what we've done with with the Air Force and then take a quick look forward on some of the challenges that we continue to face around deploying this kind of technology on a on a much larger and broader scale. Okay, so who is HTX Labs? So we're a commercial software company. We're based out of Houston, Texas, um, and we are all about immersive training. Uh, we have built an immersive training software platform using XR technology, high fidelity simulations, and really focused on helping our corporate and government customers elevate the level of proficiency and preparedness for their workforce. We believe XR technology, immersive learning and training are the next natural evolution from computer-based training, e-learning, highly effective. Um, but there's a lot of things to think about around how do you not just develop an XR training program, but how do you sustain it? How do you scale it? And that's really been a big focus for us over the past five years, working not just with the military and the Department of Defense, but also with our private sector customers. So here's our kind of standard logo slide, got to have this. Um, but want to call out some of our private sector customers, Rackspace, MasterCard, uh, Solvay, um, Johnson Controls, Baker Hughes. We've worked, um, we're based in Houston, Texas. So we've worked with a lot of kind of oil and gas heavy industry uh, companies in, in the area. Um, you know, safety training is a thing. Safety incidents are a thing. And using XR technology where mistakes are free, uh, it's a safe environment to kind of learn how to be safe in a on a refinery and offshore rig. That's uh, it's an important thing. We also partner with some amazing companies, uh, not the least of which is Epic Games. Um, uh, we're a previous mega grant winner. Um, also working with Microsoft uh, from a cloud based and and services uh, layer perspective. Uh, partner with Haptex from a Haptic Love perspective, Vario on the headsets, and, and Dynapic is a big uh, partner of ours in, in the DoD from an LMS perspective. Um, so, um, 
what I want to kind of jump into real quick is I want to take you on a bit of our XR journey and then talk about some of the challenges. So we, as I mentioned, we founded the company uh, about five years ago in 2017, um, spent a lot of time with private sector and got some decent traction. But one of the challenges that we faced was what I mentioned earlier. How do you scale? How do you deploy? How do you really get this to the point of, of impact, pun intended, to get to the learner? Um, how do you get it out of a proof of concept or a pilot project into a, a broader deployment? And that's where uh, that's where the, the creation of impact kind of uh, was triggered. So we started out working with um, an organization or initiative called Pilot Training Next within the U.S. Air Force right around 2018 uh, and 2019. And, um, you know, props to PTN, Pilot Training Next, for really driving the need and, and the the to look at innovative technology for training. So looking at AI and biometrics and immersive technology on how do we how do we create a highly qualified pilot in a short amount of time to really address the pilot shortage that exists within the Air Force, the Navy, and, and the Army. Um, so we spent a lot of time with the D, with the DoD and with the Air Force with the Navy over the past three or four years. We won several SBIR awards, um, Small Business Innovation Research Awards, over the past probably two and a half, three years, phase ones, phase twos, we're on a phase three. And this has really helped us to kind of build out, expand and adapt our uh, impact platform, not just to commercial use, but also to um, the, the challenges and and stringent kind of secure net, network security um, issues that occur within, within the Air Force and within the, the DOD. Um, over the past probably two years, we've really focused on aviation, and that's what we're going to talk about today, whether that's pilots, whether it's aircraft maintainers. That's, uh, we've worked with pilot, uh, pilot instructors. We've worked, worked with, and we're working right now with the RPA guys, which is remote, remotely piloted aircraft, the big drones. They don't like to call them drones, but, uh, but that's really what we're, we're focused on uh, right now. So something we're going to talk about a lot today is kind of how do we address the challenges that we as a, as a business and as an industry experience kind of in the early days, four, five, six years ago. And that is, and you're going to hear this a lot today, scale and sustainment. Once again, how do you get from a pilot project to a full, full on uh, deployment? Um, we can't use thumb drives as a deployment mechanism. There's got to be some infrastructure in place that allows us to not just create, but also maintain and deliver these immersive training simulations. We believe the solution is technology and tools that empower our customers to create and support their own immersive training programs. Take us out of the middle. And that's really what we've been focused on. And we're gonna talk about our Impact Studio, low no code content authoring capability, which really addresses that. Uh, we're not the experts, I'm not a pilot, we're not pilots. Let's put an instructor pilot in a headset, in a uh, high fidelity environment, and let them be the trainer. And that's really what we focused on. The outcome is we've had some really good success within the DOD, uh, deploying multiple successful uh, immersive programs across many career fields within, within the Air Force from, like I said, aircraft maintainers, pilots, and others. So probably beat this to death, but kind of digging a little bit um, a, a lower layer um, on the challenges. Uh, there's lots of them around not only creating, but deploying and, and sustaining a, an XR and immersive training curriculum and, and program. Obviously cost, it can't cost six figures, seven figures every time we want to build a new training simulation. That's just that dog won't hunt. It's not going to be sustainable. Um, Accuracy, once again, we're not the experts. If I can put a subject matter expert in a headset in a relevant environment and let them be their own actor, create their own training course, uh, that, that scales way better than, than our engineering team building simulations. <laughs> Management, once again, we have to make it incredibly easy, not just to create, but also upload, manage, and get the training to the point of impact to the student. Uh, integration. Uh, can't live on an island. So we've got to integrate with the broader learning ecosystem, whether that's learning management systems, LRSs, um, identity management systems, have to spend time and have to, you have to have a, um, an open system architecture. UI UX, um, it's gotta be good, but it's also gotta be consistent. 
Um, we don't want students to have to learn XR every time they put a headset on or a different UI or a different UX. Uh, so we need to think about from an industry perspective, what kind of standards can we put in place to make this more consistent? So the learning is about the learning objectives, not about how to deal with XR. And lastly, and maybe most importantly, is you've got to measure. So got to measure the effectiveness to, to really understand the ROI of this technology. This is new emerging technology still. And we've got to continue to prove out the value and, and effectiveness of the training. So last slide for me before we turn it over to Chris. We mentioned Pilot Training Next earlier. And once again, props to the Air Force, Pilot Training Next. There's now FTU Next, Maintenance Next. So there's, and, and this is really about how do we elevate the level of training? How do we look at technology? Like I said, AI, machine learning, biometrics, immersive technology. Historically, pilots learned how to, how to fly it using chair flying, literally sitting in a chair. Um, and our mission on Pilot Training Next was around basically building a PARTAS trainer for to teach emergency procedures. Uh, you know, pilot's worst nightmare, cockpit cat, or the engine catches on fire, what do you do? There is a checklist that they have to go through to alleviate the situation. You really can't learn how to do that in a chair. But if I can put you in a virtual T6 and present you with that exact challenge, I'm going to heighten your sense of awareness, your anxiety, in the real, like, a, like you'd be in the real world, and make you go through that entire checklist. So it's that learn by doing, that's how humans learn. So the challenge that we faced was we were focused on the T6, we built 12 emergency procedures and it took way too long and it took way too much money. Um, and there's 62 EPs just for the T6. And then you think about scaling that across the Department of Defense, the number of airframes, it's just not viable. And that's really what sparked our, um, the need for something like Impact Studio. And what we've done is created a fully instrumented interactive T6 that I can put a instructor pilot in and create any training simulation. Um, and that's how we scale this. And Chris is gonna talk about that in more detail. So I don't wanna steal too much thunder on that. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and turn things over to Chris to dig in on, on Impact. You're gonna see some videos, you're gonna see a live demo, um, and we'll take it from there. And I should have okay. just stopped sharing. Yep, fantastic, thank you, Scott. Again, my name is Chris Verrett, I'm the CTO here at HTX Labs. Um, can I get a quick confirmation that my screen is up and you're seeing Impact Immersive Training Platform? Yep. Awesome. All right, so Scott, talked through our journey, he, he summarized the challenge that we're seeing in the Air Force, and we'll just keep saying those two S words. It's, it's all about scale and sustainment. We've seen so many prototypes and proofs of concepts across the Air Force and the broader DOD, different spark cells. Everybody's doing things a little bit differently. Everybody's kind of reinventing the wheel in lots of different places. And so with that backdrop, that is what has driven us uh, more than anything else to build out Impact, which is our immersive training platform. So we're going to go through a series of slides here. Uh, it won't take too long. We'll try to get out of PowerPoint pretty quickly, but I want to talk through some high-level concepts. Uh, then we will actually get into a bit of a live demo where I'll walk through some things and hopefully uh, hopefully hop in bandwidth and, and latency will we'll play nice with us while we try to do that. So high-level impact is it's a commercial software product. It is a commercial immersive training platform. IMPACT stands for Experience Management Platform for Advanced Conditioning and Training. And we're the first to admit that that is a mouthful. Um, so it also can stand for Empower Action because that really speaks to the type of training that can be created on this platform. It's meant to allow students and learners to train safely uh, more effectively and ultimately to feel more empowered uh, with whatever their mission is and, you know, within the Air Force, whether that's going to work on aircraft as a, main, as a maintainer or it's to go fly an aircraft. And so IMPACT has three primary components that we'll dig into more detail as we progress through the slides here. But the first component is IMPACT Studio, which is all about creation. 
like Scott talked about at a high level, this allows both developers, but also instructors and subject matter experts, folks that don't know how to write code, it allows them to rapidly create meaningful immersive training content. We talk about this concept of capturing expertise or transferring experience. And so you look at where XR technology is today and just where it's come over the last five years, and we're at a point in history now beyond anywhere we've ever been before where I can take this type of technology and I can capture somebody's expertise. And it starts to sound a little bit like you know something you'd see in the matrix. We're not building the holodeck yet, but we can capture so much data within these virtual environments with a subject matter expert immersed in those. We can capture audio, we can capture telemetry, we can capture the procedural interactions of how they're manipulating these virtual environments. And it's, it's rich data sets that we can codify into lessons and then publish over here to the middle to our cloud-based portion of the platform. And from here, this is where students can now learn from experts directly. And they can do so on not just virtual reality devices, but really a variety of hardware devices. And so this really speaks to that train anytime, anywhere, on any device, which all of that's really fundamental, we believe, to scaling this technology and then ultimately being able to scale it or uh, sustain it over time. And then the last leg on this, this three-legged stool, if you will, here is all about the data. So we're capturing not just rich data sets when we capture expertise over here on the far left, but we're capturing rich data sets of usage and performance analytics in the middle here as students take the training. And with that, we can measure effectiveness. We can monitor for trends over time. Uh, we can integrate that with the broader learning ecosystem. So usually learning management systems or learning record stores, we can follow standards like XAPI, uh, we can integrate with analytics engines, cognitive engines. So there's there's the integration component to this is something that we'll talk more about as well because that's really key. Like we're not trying to be a replacement strategy. This has to be an augmentation strategy to existing, in this case, within the context of this use case, uh, existing Air Force uh, learning ecosystem. This next slide, drives at another layer of detail down for impact. And so you look at create, manage, learn, and measure. That's, that's really the formula here. And early on, as we were building out our platform, you know, we recognized that without meaningful immersive content, there's nothing to manage, there's nothing to learn, and there's nothing to measure. And we looked at the ways that we were building content at the time, and Scott talked about pilot training next, and that's traditionally how a lot of folks are building this content. And it's it, it tends to not scale because it's too expensive and it takes too long. And then you also end up with a wide variety of, of user experiences and, and interaction models that make it harder for learners to, to actually learn what they should be learning within those environments. And so we created Impact Studio, which is a no-code self-authoring, immersive self-authoring product. And we're going to see some examples of this, but what it allows you to do high level is experts can immerse themselves in these visually um, high fidelity environments that are aesthetically accurate, they're contextually accurate, and they can create a large variety of different types of immersive lessons. These could be procedural or task-based lessons, such as an instructor pilot being in a cockpit and going through an emergency procedure. What do I do in a, fi in a fire in flight and executing the proper bold face or electrical fire? Or maybe it's normal procedures where they're going to be doing a, an engine shutdown or a pre-flight inspection or an over the rails inspection. But it could be maintenance related. It could be, hey, I, I want to capture the steps that I know are in this TO that show me how to service the shock strut on the nose landing gear to C-130. Uh, the sky's kind of limit here is any procedural task actually are pretty relevant to this, and this translates to the, the private sector as well. Um, but also, it doesn't have to be procedural. It could be academic in nature. So I could be in an immersive environment, and I could teach a subject matter around the hydraulic system or the fuel system, things that are traditionally taught you know, with ILT, instructor-led training, or computer-based computer training, PowerPoint. I can pull this into a fully immersive environment where it's less interactive in this case, 
but the student is immersed in this world and it can see my avatar, can see what I'm pointing at, what I'm talking through, can inspect things, and we'll show some examples of this as well. So there's a large variety of things that you can do with Impact Studio, and then ultimately you publish that to our cloud-based environment where we host content that's created on Impact. We can also host content that was created in other places as well. It could be 360 video, it could be 2D. 2D video. It could be content that was built on, a, on another game engine. I should say that all of this over here on the left with Impact Studio and our VR clients, which is what students access over here on either tablets or VR headsets or on just Windows using mouse and keyboard, that is all built on top of the Unreal Gaming Engine. And then everything in the cloud is hosted and developed on Microsoft Azure technology. So for the Air Force, for DOD customers, that's all on Azure for government, which gives us a higher level of security. It's a minimum impact level four or IL4 environment, uh, if you're familiar with that uh, security kind of uh, protocol. And that has helped us tremendously within the Air Force and the Navy. And then the last piece over here, we've talked about being able to measure the data compare progress to a past performance, and then ultimately integrate that with a larger learning ecosystem. This slide really focuses on our goal of being as content agnostic as possible, and also hardware agnostic as possible. So up on the top here, you can see different types of content. The content that we build on Impact, which is built on Unreal, that's ultimately Unreal content, but we want to be able to support other types of content as well. Uh, a large challenge that we've seen throughout the Air Force is that digital training content is often scattered, it's siloed, uh, the way that they get it from one computer to another is often a thumb drive, and so by putting this all in a secure centralized cloud environment and then allowing that to be delivered to multiple types of hardware devices, where we change, it, we manage the interaction model as necessary so that you can do this in room scale VR, you can do this in standalone VR, as the Oculus Quest and Vive Focus 3 was recently announced, uh, Pico Neo, these headsets have given us a lot more options, but then also tablets and laptops and desktops as well. And what we found is that while it would be great if everybody always had a Vario VR2 headset and could do full scale or room scale VR, we often have to trade immersiveness for more scalability in order to reach more people. So going back to that, that S word, scalability, this is key to allowing this to scale, we believe, across the Air Force and really in, in any location that's trying to implement an XR training program. Last diagram slide, I promise. Uh, this one really digs into how we create the content itself. And so taking it one more layer deeper in detail, we have two different components to content creation. So there is this impact software development kit built on Unreal. This is our low code solution. And then we have Impact Studio, which is our no-code solution. But they work in concert together. And to fully understand that, you have to look at who is using which, who is using each of these products. And so the SDK is something that we use ourselves. We eat our own dog food, so to speak, but also other third-party developers, US Air Force developers, leverage this as well. And the purpose of this is to allow us to more efficiently and effectively build virtual environments that are that are accurate, that are aesthetically accurate, that, that have the right interaction built in. We call these workspaces, and so kind of hard to see here, but you can see there's a, a T6 alpha uh, workspace here on the top, and that's a C130J uh, workspace here on the bottom. And understand that no training at this point is being created, but this is actually a, a, a one of our one of our focus areas is we separate these workspaces these virtual environments, we completely separate them from any training that's created over here. These environments, environments think of these as, as a classroom. We're creating classrooms for these people over here, these instructors, these subject matter experts, these career field, field managers, and ourselves as well. But like Scott said, we're not the experts in aircraft maintenance or in pilot training. So ideally, we want to put the experts in these environments and allow them to create the type of training examples that you see right here under maintenance training and pilot training. But we also recognize that XR technology, we've come a long way in the last four or five years, but it's still a new, it's, just, it's a new medium for a lot of folks. And so when we're working with you know, seven level maintainers at Shepard Air Force Base, for example, that have been teaching aeronautical ground equipment age for the last 25 years, they may not be ready to jump into a headset to do XR self uh, content self-authoring. And so 
we're we're kind of in this this transition period where we're we're doing probably more white glove service than we want to long term where we're helping customers or onboarding them and helping them use these content creation tools more effectively. Um, but this is all fundamental to how do I scale and sustain this over time. There are over 3,500 technical training courses for pilots and maintainers in Air Education Training Command alone, that's AETC in the Air Force, that have been taught a traditional way for many, many, many years. They all need to be leveled up into this more immersive experiential way of learning. And if, if HTX is building all of those, we can't. We have to scale this to other people and get these content creation tools into their hands. And then over here on the right, once you've created it, you publish it, students access it, we can integrate with a variety of different types of, uh, in this case, Air Force learning systems. One in particular that we partner very closely with is, is Motar, which uh, Scott mentioned as Dynapic is the, uh, the company behind that. And so we work very well with them. They're a learning management system, student dashboard, uh, instructor dashboard, and we are serving up all of this content to them. And so that that is also, I think, key to this because we, again, we're plugging into existing learning ecosystem. We have to be able to do that and not just try to be a one-stop shop for everything. Okay, so with that, I promise that was the last diagram slide. We're gonna watch a, a short video here, uh, not a live stream in, it's just recorded, but this is, I'm going to introduce Alisa Sieber Johnson. She is a former Marine Corps KC-130J pilot. She is also our VR content producer. So if I go backwards one moment, for just a moment here, she leads the team at, at HTX Labs that builds these immersive workspaces. So probably stating the obvious, but her subject matter expertise uh, helps tremendously from a pilot's perspective and understanding these aircraft. So I'm going to go ahead and play this video. Hello, I'm Elisa Sieber Johnson. I served in the Marine Corps as a KC-130J pilot, and I now work for HTX Labs as a content producer. Today, I'm going to show you how easy it is to create immersive content on our MPAC platform. Accessing MPAC Studio from within a virtual reality headset allows you to experience virtual workspaces that set the scene to create your lessons. These virtual workspaces are highly realistic representations of real-world environments that can be pre-configured for demonstrating specific knowledge. These configurations allow for flexible reuse of the environments and allow instructors to create a broad range of lessons. To demonstrate MPAC's capabilities, I'm going to be recording myself performing an engine shutdown checklist. When I begin the recording, MPAC will capture my narration as well as all of my actions. Engine shutdown checklist. Parking brake, set. Landing and taxi lights, off. Transponder, off. Avionics master switch, off. PCL, idle. Once recordings are saved, instructors can use our no-code content offering platform to publish them as lessons in one of several different types of game modes. In explore mode, Students can safely learn from the environment and identify components highlighted by the lesson creator. In watch mode, a procedure is demonstrated by an avatar performing expert actions with appropriate narration. In guide mode, the student follows along with the behavior modeled by the expert in a safe and repeatable manner. Finally, in assessment mode, student progress is compared to that of the instructors, to previous performances, and against fellow peers, highlighting problem areas where they should focus their training efforts. In this watch mode example, the same engine shutdown procedure is performed while in a systems configuration, allowing the students to see the behavior of their instructor and how it affects the individual systems of the T-6 aircraft. Ultimately, empowering students to be more prepared when facing the real world in a safe, repeatable, and scalable environment. Discover how we are empowering the future of learning today at htxlabs.com. All right, thank you, Elisa. So with that backdrop, 
little more visual context to uh, specific to what types of content can be created, what I'm going to do next is get out of PowerPoint for a few minutes and show a little more detail into what Elisa was just showing us over the video. So to start with, I'm going to come over here to the web front end of our impact platform. In particular, we're looking at the web portion of Impact Studio. And so we just watched Elisa create a, an engine shutdown lesson. You can see that right here. This is our workspace screen. So remember, a workspace is a virtual environment. Uh, we have a T6 environment here. We also have a C130J environment. And so specific to the T6A, remember, workspaces are separate from the lessons. We're overlaying lessons on top of them, but that doesn't change the underlying workspace. And so by looking at this workspace, we can see these lessons have been created. And if I wanted to, I could create another lesson. I could come in here and give it a, a name and a description and a version. And then based on the recordings that I have done in VR, I can add those to different game modes. And so a little more detail to what Elisa was talking about is Explore mode is a self-paced version of the environment where students can go in and learn at their own pace. Watch mode is something that they can use to watch an instructor from a third-person perspective. So if you have no idea what you're doing, that's probably where you want to start. But then when you're ready to try it yourself, you can go into guide mode. And now your perspective changes from a third-person perspective to a first-person perspective. So now you're essentially embodying the instructor or the subject matter expert, and you're learning from them step by step. But it's guide mode, so the training wheels are still on. Are still on. Things are highlighted in the environment. We're going to look at this firsthand in a moment. And then the last mode here is the assessment mode, where it's the same as guide mode, first person perspective, but I am the, the training wheels have come off, and so this is where we are going to actually measure your your. Your, uh, your progress and, and ultimately give you a score at the end. There's also the concept of injecting quizzes into these virtual environments, which can also be a handy way of testing student knowledge throughout the lessons. Once I've created a lesson, I can add it to an experience. Think of an experience as a grouping of like lessons. And so you can see here we have this T6A ground training experience. You can see there's a lot of other experiences here too. These were all created through the no code content offering. And you can start to get an appreciation for if this was just HGX building these lessons and experiences, this would not scale. But you start getting subject matter experts within the Air Force in here, and it does start to scale. Now we're going to go back to the main portion of the platform. You can see here that this is where we would access the T6A ground training experience. We can also touch on a few other things here as well. There's other we call these shelves. This is a place to group similar experiences, a lot of different types of content on here. But from an administrative perspective, I can look at usage analytics on the platform. I can also look at performance analytics, and we have different ways of visualizing a student's performance. In this case, it was from a maintenance perspective, changing the wheel and tire on a C-130. I can see this is what the expert did step by step, and I can see how that maps to two different student attempts and where they might have done something unnecessary, where they did something out of order, and I can actually drill into detail. So this gives just a bit of a, a highlight or spotlight on the level of detail in terms of the data sets that we're capturing that we can visualize with an impact, but we can also share with learning management systems, analytics engines, and things like that. We can also touch on the fact that we can manage users here, it admins, users themselves, these are the trainees, and then studio users, content creators. We've touched on the fact that Impact is an immersive content management platform as well. It's cloud-based. I can upload a lot of different types of digital training content here. I can put those inside of experiences and then entitle those to students very, very quickly. And then they can access that training on many different types of devices. So train anytime, anywhere on any device, right? That's, that's kind of the mantra we keep going for. You can train on Windows, mouse and keyboard, but also Windows-based headsets, portable headsets, iPads, et cetera. Uh, lastly here, you can link to LMSs. So uh, some, we've mentioned Motar, we can link a, an account 
to a learning management system or another identity management system like an LDAP or, or Active Directory, so you have a more seamless user experience, single sign-on. Um, but you can even manage entitlements from the LMS itself, which in some cases makes more sense because that's where you're building your curriculum and your courses. So next, I am going to actually hop into VR and let's see if I can find the screen. There it is. Now, I will admit that Hopin is probably not going to give us the uh, give us the, uh, the the level of speed that we would like, but I'm going to try to move my head rather slowly as as we go through this, and hopefully it uh, it's smooth enough. So, where we are looking right now is this is. Impact home. We call this our home environment. And so this is the environment that you access whether you're in VR, you're on a tablet, or you're just using a mouse and keyboard on a Windows PC. And so we saw Elisa in the video create this T6A ground training experience and she published it. So I have access it, I have access to it here. All of the training that I have access to is in that dashboard. And now as a student, I can come in here and I'm in the same environment. And you can see that I have options here. I can load up different scenarios, different lessons that are part of this experience. I can also go into explore mode. So this is something to also note that from a student perspective, I can come into these immersive workspaces and from a pilot perspective, this is kind of called switchology. So the way that they've done this quite a bit in the past is stare at a poster on the wall and I can kind of pretend like I would hit that switch or I would hit this switch and this is what would happen. Well, this is much better than chair flying or staring at a poster because in here I can actually interact with the entire aircraft and see what things do. I'm gonna step back just a moment here so I don't hit my desk. So I can turn on the battery and the generator and the avionics master. I could go through a full aircraft start procedure and I'm probably not going to go through all of that just for the sake of time, but you can see things are starting to interact here. I can actually start the aircraft, and you can see that my, my temperature is spinning up, ITT, we're starting to get some thrust, which is in one. Um, I can go ahead and uh, PCL to idle here, and that will continue to spin up. And if we waited long enough, but we're not going to because we're gonna, we don't want to run out of time, uh, the aircraft would actually spin up. So I'm just learning self-paced as a student. But now I want to see what my instructor had to say. So I can go to engine shutdown. And in the video, you saw that we touched on what does watch mode look like for, from, from a third person perspective, I can watch the instructor. But I'm, I'm going to go into guided mode where I'm taking a first person perspective and I have to go through the same steps myself that my instructor did. And you can see that I have a checklist of things that she did. It's guide mode, so I have hints, so I know, okay, I need to set the landing gear first. We start checking that off. Avionics master, PCL, idle, PCL off. And I can go through this process, and this is just a quick example of something that was created very rapidly by an instructor, published through the cloud, and now I'm able to access it. So that entire loop could actually happen within the span of 15 minutes if my instructor wanted to go record something, publish it, and say, hey, it's ready for you. And I'm at an entirely different geographical location, and I can go in there and actually see what she had to say. Um, you know, within this explore mode that we're in, we can access lots of other parts of the aircraft, so it goes back to that morning at my own pace. I'm going to go back to the home environment here to briefly touch on studio where I can pretend that I'm an instructor or subject matter expert. So this is what Elisa was doing. Now that I'm in here, I can record myself teaching a lesson. Now that could be a procedural lesson where I'm in the cockpit and I'm actually going through a checklist, but it could also be an academic lesson. And that's a differentiator that we'd like, that we'd like to point out is that in these environments, I can give students superpowers. I can visualize the different systems, the electrical systems, the hydraulic system, the fuel system. Now, there's not a lot going on right now because the aircraft isn't on, but we've got a shortcut for that. So, engine on. And I can see that come to life. Now, imagine as an instructor or especially as, as maybe a civilian contractor that understands these systems, 
I can record myself teaching a lesson on this and using instructional aids and laser pointers to really get at the heart of it. That's a lot better than a PowerPoint that a student would maybe go through or staring at system schematics and diagrams. Especially when I can take those diagrams and I can pull them into the immersive environment and a student can actually see what's happening here, which is usually very esoteric, but compare that to what's happening in the aircraft itself. I'm peeking through my headset for a moment to see how we're doing on time. I think I have time to show one more thing here. We'll go back home and we'll look at one other environment. So we've been focusing on the pilot perspective. Now let's take a look at some of the maintenance use cases here. This is going to be a larger environment where I'm going to pretend that I'm a crew chief and put on some PPE gear and head out to this hangar. Cross over to ECP because I don't want any MPs coming after me. And in here, remember I'm in studio mode, so I have the ability to teach different types of lessons and record myself. So another academic, or we call it immersive academic example, would be I could teach a lesson on the hydraulic system. Again, I'm not interacting with anything here, but I could record myself teaching a lesson about how does this hydro utility hydraulic panel work, how do the pressure lines flow out here and follow down to the back of the aircraft and flight actu actuators, and the return line come back, flowing back through the reservoir and then rinse and repeat. I don't really know what I'm talking about there. I, hung around the aircraft maintainers enough to be able to say a few words that make sense, but a seven level coming in here and talking through that would be a lot more effective. And they could do that by recording themselves, publishing it, and now the student could watch that. But I can also come in here as a crew chief that's been doing this for a while, and I can create a lesson on how to change that wheel and tire. This is going to be more interactive, more procedural. I add in my wheel and tire replacement tools. So I've got my new tire, I've got some tools over here, I'm not going to go through this entire thing because it could take a while, but you can see this is going to be very interactive. I can cut the safety wire. I can pull it off, inspect it, put it in my FOD bag, grab my socket wrench. Chris, I wanted to note that it is it is dragging behind what you're saying, so that's hopping, not... Copy. Not no, I, I appreciate that. Well... Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and wrap this up. You can see that we could go through this entire section here, take the wheel entire fully off. Um, we have some videos where you can, you can watch those if you want to see the entire process. But that's a, that is a quick drive-by of what's possible in here, possible to do in here, and builds on the video that we saw from Elisa. So I'm going to come out of the headset, apologize for my headset here, and come back to PowerPoint. So... That was the live demo. Now, the last part of this that we'll talk through is more specifically how is impact being used within the Department of Defense, specifically within the U.S. Air Force, to help with this scalability and sustainment challenge that's really the theme of this entire presentation. And we're going to talk through how this is being done across career fields, it's being done across aircraft, and, and also even branches because we're working with the Navy as well. The challenges are many. These five that are listed here are not an exhaustive list, but they are a good uh, grouping of similar common challenges across all of the use cases that we've been involved in. Uh, there's a lot of courses out there that have been taught a traditional way. How do we translate that into an XR environment, into an immersive learning environment? There needs to be a recipe, a methodology for doing that. There's a whole host of hardware and infrastructure and cybersecurity issues that, that we can speak to how we're addressing those. Um, there's an acceptance and an adoption challenge, especially with some of the uh, maybe older generation of instructors that have been doing this for a long time, helping them understand how they can start to incorporate immersive technology in their classrooms and actually how they can scale themselves by using these authoring tools to capture their expertise. We wanna make this more student centric. That's a challenge as well. There's so much instructor led training and uh, PowerPoint we want to make this more about the students and then everything around deployment and distribution. We've kind of beat that to death. The solution, there's really three key points. We need to build, build content faster. That's content authoring. We need to be able to manage it and distribute it more securely and centralized. That's the distribution platform. It needs to be cloud-based. And the third piece is it needs to be able to plug in to the, the existing learning ecosystem. And that's the integration piece. Success factors that we've seen already, and we'll 
we'll talk on the next couple slides about this, is that this has shortened the training cycle. Uh, we've seen evidence of that, especially uh, uh, with the pilots being able to produce pilots more quickly. It's provided more flexible training for students, so they can train anytime, anywhere, on any device, and ultimately it has produced more prepared and proficient students. Within maintenance training, we're involved with everything from initial skills training, so things that students are going to learn right out after they're done with boot camp, but also higher level, more sophisticated advanced training around career development programs, things like avionics training or engines training, that is going to be more specific to like five level or seven level training. The goals for these are similar or identical to the, the overarching uh, challenges and goals from the previous slide, but we're trying to create better maintainers, safer maintainers. We need to be able to translate these traditional courses into XR. One example with a course called Crew Chief Fundamentals that's taught at Shepard Air Force Base, which has been taught that way for decades. And every, every Air, uh, Air Force uh, person that's coming through that's going to be a crew chief goes through Shepard. And so translating that course into a more experiential uh, engaging lear uh, learning environment is definitely a challenge. Um, overcoming hardware and infrastructure challenges. I'll mention Shepard again. It's an older base. There's a lot of bases like that. And you're in the hangar where they teach, how do I get this type of technology in there where I don't have fiber running through it? And so maybe not even commercial Wi-Fi. Uh, there's security challenges as well. How do I get on Air Force networks? We talk about authority to operate, ATO. So not enough time now to get into all the details, but that's all part of the challenges. I mentioned gaining adoption from instructors, getting them to embrace this technology, and then being able to track student progress over time. Because if we're not showing that this is a more effective way to learn, then it's not gonna stick. And that's really fundamental to allowing this to be sustained over time because nobody, the people that are making the budgetary decisions aren't going to keep making those decisions if we can't prove that this is more effective. So a lot of this is motherhood and apple pie, especially for this audience, I know, but the solution, you know, make better maintainers. We wanna allow more self-paced immersive learning. Translating it into XR, traditional learning, we need a repeatable recipe. And we really believe that that means we're using development tools and we're expanding that to a larger community so that it's a more uniform and consistent way to learn and we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, we've also seen so many examples within the Air Force of the same aircraft being virtualized, not, not once, not twice, but more than twice. And that's Air, Air Force dollars being spent multiple times to create the same aircraft. And it's being done in different ways. So wouldn't it be great if we could consolidate that onto common development tools and authoring tools? Um, supporting multimodal and offline mode, that's one of the ways that we're overcoming hardware challenges and infrastructure challenges. We know we, we have to be able to run off network. Uh, we have to be able to still collect data and then store and forward that data once it comes back on network. It's not the same as deploying at a MasterCard or within corporate America. We have to be able to make this technology make sense at a place like Shepard Air Force Base. Talked about empowering SMEs with authoring tools. We've talked about integrating with Air Force learning systems. I'm going a little bit faster here because I know we're going to get short on time. We're bumping up against it. The outcome has been very successful. Um, the biggest thing I'll note here is that with crew chief fundamentals, we've seen a 46.1% reduction in training time. The standard traditional course is taught in 24 days with this immersive learning course, which you see down here in the bottom left, was taught in about half that time. I should mention that there's an organization, tech, Technical Training Transformation, which grew out of something called Maintenance Next that we have been working very closely with. We actually um, have a phase three with T, T3, and they have been instrumental with helping us drive these, the, these, these thoughts around scale and sustainability within the Air Force. So kind of consider them our partners in crime with really everything that we're talking about here within the Air Force. We're not gonna go through these videos short on time and you saw some of this inside of VR itself. Pilot training use cases, high level, similar as maintenance, but also somewhat different. There's a pilot shortage, there's an instructor shortage, which leads to the pilot shortage. We want them to be safer. There's a whole host of things. We're working with pilot instructors, we're working with RPA, remotely piloted aircraft. We're also working with the Navy. Um, Solution is very much the same across many of these, but we've already seen in terms of outcomes, students are graduating early. We saw proof of this back with pilot training next. We're seeing instructors starting to adopt this technology and students, especially as has been prevalent with COVID-19, students have been able to train more flexibly, which has been really, really important when they can't get to the base 
and they still need to get reps, reps in or repetitions in. Another video here that we don't need to watch because I showed it to you in VR. All right, wrapping up slide, really looking forward and tying a bow on all of this and beating scale and sustainment completely to death right now. That's what this is all about. Um, we're not interested in building prototypes and building proofs of concept. That's what everybody's been doing 2016, 17, 18, and on. We're at a point now, and especially within the Air Force, we have to be able to make this operational. We have to be able to scale and sustain it. And fundamental to that is having a repeatable methodology. And that's what impact aims to do. That's why we built impact. I mentioned the 3,500 courses within AETC alone. We're never going to create those courses unless we can accelerate content creation. We need content authoring tools. We need to get more people involved with those. That includes instructors and SMEs that can use the no code, but that also means other developer organizations that can use the low code to build these fantastic immersive environments. We need a way to centrally and securely manage that content. It's got to be cloud-based. It's got to be able to handle sensitive data, things like CUI or FOUO data. And it needs to be as hardware and content agnostic as possible in order for this to scale. And last, but certainly not least, we need to capture rich data sets of both usage and performance data. We need to be able to leverage that data to further adapt the training to make it more student centric, ramp it up in difficulty if they're not having, if they're not being challenged, vice versa, if that's, if that's true, and test them on things that they struggle with. But we can't do that without a larger scale data set that's been captured over time. And we need to be able to integrate this with complementary systems, learning management systems, learning record stores, analytics engines, et cetera. And I apologize for speeding up towards the end of this, but I wanted to get through it. That is, that is the last slide. And so with that, um, I will pause and we would love to take any questions that you may have about uh, this presentation, anything that Scott or I talked through. And thank you very much for your time and, and your attention. Well, thank you very much for all these insights. Um, it was extremely useful and I think our audience really appreciated the fact that we had a lot of content here in your presentation, both from you, Scott, and you, Chris. Um, so we're going to go through the different questions of the audience now. Um, the first question we got at the moment is a uh, question about the activities you could have with the Navy on top of the activities that you had with the Air Force and how you approach that and how you've been solving some other challenges for the Navy. Yep. Scott, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we're doing something very similar to what we did with the Air Force. Um, Air Force flies a T-6 Alpha um, and the Navy flies a T-6 Bravo. So we are we just started our engagement with the Navy um, and we've got a team down at Corpus Christi at Sinatra right now, uh, really kind of digging in on the on the details, but building basically a flight trainer that we similar to what we built for the Air Force, teaching normal procedures, emergency procedures, um, and and all in a you know all in a VR headset, tablets, laptop. So uh, very similar to what we've done with the Air Force, but they saw what we did with the Air Force and uh, basically wanted some of that. Um, as of yesterday, they also talked about the T forty five. Uh, T-44, some other uh, training uh, airframes as well, and supporting the same kind of lessons on those air, airframes, which is, to Chris's point, we try to separate environment from lessons so that we can very quickly take a, a lesson and put it on top of a, a different environment and get the economies of scale there. Thank you. Thank you for these points. Uh, there's another question that came out that is pretty interesting. Um, given the fact that you're not the largest company in the simulation field, how do you work with government customers? Uh, it is sometimes tricky. Uh, there is a, a very strong complexity that is, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, brought back uh, from the experience of those who are trying. So how did you deal with government? What was your uh, secret? And how did you approach that challenge? Because it's something very different uh, depending on the industries. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. that yeah, um, I would never have put our company up against the U.S. government as a small business. I worked for the government 35 years ago, and that contracting process is uh, is terrible. But uh, not 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 anymore with with uh, organizations like Naval X, Adventures, Air Army Futures Command. This is all about 
you know, this is not your father's military. This is this is an innovative, emerging, aggressive uh, organization. And uh, we got lucky. We bumped into Lieutenant Colonel Eric Fram, that, who works out of Boston Capital Factory. He saw what we were doing outside the military and and saw the he took the leap uh, of bringing that platform to the to the Air Force. And that's where we, how we got started with pilot training next. And then he said, you got to go direct. Um, so that's where we got on the the cyber process and went through the phase ones and twos and and yeah, the U.S. Air Force is is our venture arm, frankly, and they funded a lot of the expansion and they've gotten really good value value out of that, and we continue to work with them. So the cyber process is amazing. Chris, do you have any uh, any points to to add in addition of that? Yeah, I, it's not really, um, but I think that. Um, we would never have imagined this when we got started for sure, but it's really been a breath of fresh air, especially as we've waited for um, the commercial sector to really start to catch up because um, that's where we started in 2017, 2018. And then to dive into pilot training next where they're leading edge, tip of the spear, XR, biometrics, um, analytics, everything in between. It's It's been a great place for, for our company. But I think also back to the original question, um, I mean, SBIR absolutely has helped, but I would also, I'll give props to some of the organizations that we've worked with in, within the Air Force again. Uh, you have to find champions, and we've, we've been fortunate to find great champions within the Air Force. And so I mentioned uh, technical training transformation, so that's actually A9-23, uh, AETC A9-23, and they've been fantastic to work with, and they were maintenance next before that. Um, we're mo working with some fantastic organizations out of Randolph Air Force Base on the pilot side, instructor pilots and RPA. And, you know, you, you, we couldn't have gotten as far as we did without those champions um, helping us figure out what they need and what to build, but also adopting the platform, adopting the content creation tools and using it to capture their expertise. Because if they're not doing that, then everything else is sort of for naught. So um, we're, we're very thankful for, for the folks that have been working so closely with us within the Air Force. Thank you very much. It's, it's very helping. I believe that a lot of companies uh, are at the state where you were before, uh, where they ask themselves how to uh, uh, get in contact and enter in relation with uh, government customers. So it's uh, it's very uh, very interesting. So we have another uh, another note and another uh, question from uh, Malcolm. Malcolm is talking about the Neo 2i behind you uh, that uh, you you have on your uh, on your desk, Chris. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the usage you're doing of it and uh, how you uh, integrate with it? <laughs> Oh, also, I don't have one, Malcolm, so... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> well, we, we, actually, we actually have a, uh, Malcolm, uh, we, have a, we have a Pico Neo 3, too, uh, that we've been uh, testing out, so we're very appreciative for, it, it was a, a, a dev kit, obviously. Um, but, uh, no, yeah, we, we do support the Pico Neo. I mean, we, we, we're trying to support the best portable headsets out there. Um, and you know, Pico is something that I think gives us uh, a lot of options. And yeah, I didn't know that you'd be in the audience, but that was, uh, I guess, maybe strategically positioned right there for you. Hey, uh, real Sebastian, real quick, I just want to jump in. I've got a. I'm going to have to drop. This is Rick. Uh, I've got a, a meeting with the lawyers uh, that, that I can't miss. So I only got about two minutes left. Um, but I wanted to to thank you guys, Chris and Scott. Fantastic. Um, I, I think. With the work you've done with Pilot Training Next, certainly in the Air Force, I think you know it establishes a platform like you talked about using the DOD and that funding and development resource. And then I just wondered, have you had any success working with the civilian sector yet? I know you will because you have the platform. And so that, that makes it capable, but have you had any success yet working? There was, somebody had a question earlier about ATO approval, but really it's FAA regulators and commercial airline uh, pilot training. Have you, have you seen any interest yet? Yeah, there's we've 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 seen some interest in in private aviation, uh, talking with organizations like NetJets and and some commercial aviation, and certainly the parallels are um, you know easy to figure out um, whether it's training pilots or, or aircraft maintainers or somebody in a refinery maintaining uh, you know it's 
its tools and wrenches and procedures and safety. So, uh, yeah, well, we would love to kind of uh, figure out, uh, you know, we don't have the connections, so we would love to, um, I know you do. Um, so I'd love to uh, chat about that next week. Excellent. Well, hey, guys, thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you so much. And I wish I didn't have to drop it. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined. Um, this was, uh, I think uh, you guys had the right spot. This was the highlight of uh, some tremendous speakers uh, that we had. That Thanks to Sebastian, uh, lined up some great people. So thank Tough you very much, guys, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week. Tough Thanks to follow right. Seb, though. He's, our, he's a story <laughs> to <play. laughs> Thank you, Scott. I'm going to blush now. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rick. Uh, thanks, everybody. I think we reached the, the end of our session today. I'm going to check if we still have some, some questions and comments uh, that we may have missed uh, real quick. Uh, but it seems that it seems that we tackled pretty much everything we had there. So Helen had a question about oh, publishing the efficiency in time. And certainly we capture that. We capture the time of every step, every interaction uh, through a lesson and kind of diff that against the experts. So certainly we can uh, we can take it offline and, and dig a little deeper on that. Thanks, Ab, again for uh, inviting us. Happy to do this on a short notice anytime. <laughs> All right. Well, Good. thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that concludes our uh, sessions for this uh, global uh, summit for the uh, VRAR Association uh, for this summer. Uh, we're really happy to be with you uh, during, during that week. Uh, any more questions, you can go to our committee page. Uh, or engage with us directly, either myself or uh, with uh, Evi, my co-chair, uh, and uh, we'll be in contact. Talk to you soon, everyone. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.